Living Room Logic. Welcome back to Season 2 of Living Room Logic. This episode, me and the other lad attempt to modify your opinion of GMOs. We explain how more things than you might think aren't exactly natural, and of course we ask, what the hell are designer babies? So select correctly by following or subscribing to us wherever you get your podcasts and check out our Facebook, Twitter or Instagram at Living Room Logic to join our logical following. This season is supported by FameLab, which is celebrating its ninth and final year in Ireland. Get excited for the competition's national final, which will take place at the end of September. Welcome back, everyone, to a, another episode of Living Room Logic. Me and Aiden here are happy out. And this week, we are talking about GMOs, okay? Mm. They're, they're something that you most oftenly hear these days spoken in the same uh, line as chemtrails or other conspiracies going around. Mm-hmm. When in reality, they are not at all that. And uh, we're tr- going to try and... Describe exactly what a GMO is, a genetically modified organism, Mm -hmm. which, you know, if you can understand those three words, you might be able to figure it out. But we're (laughs) going to explain the basically why we have it, how we got here and how we're going to use it and maybe have a little chat about the future of it, too. So, Aidan, why? Well, it's a long (laughs) story. And please make it nice, short and concise. We, <laughs> we, we don't have the time and the listeners don't care. <laughs> they don't care enough. Give, give, give us the quick, the you quick, know happy what? version. We don't blame you either. So no. <laughs> humans have been modifying the genes of plants and animals for thousands of years. And actually, to be honest, it really started about 10,000 years ago when humans in different parts of the world started cultivating their crops and putting them beside their their little yurts causing a a beautiful change in the world (laughs) a revolution (laughs) of society but little did they know that every single rotation of a crop they would always kind of pick the bigger ones maybe the ones that gave a bit more food the the ones that are a little bit different from the wild population that they first foraged maybe hundreds of years before and this is unbeknown to them it's actually called selective breeding and and today in evolution we call it artificial selection and the crazy thing is that pretty much every single plant and animal that we eat or use in products are genetically very different to their pre-human ancestors so you said quick I'll give you a 30 second biology class with a little bit of genetics. Okay, don't freak out. Here we okay, go. Just let, let me get my notes. Yeah, and set the timer. Okay, let's go. Different organisms of the same species naturally vary slightly in their genetic makeup. Okay, and this occurs through random genetic mutations in a population. And humans realized early on that if you isolate and breed organisms that have a new mutation, that their offspring will also have this trait and the specific trait may even be stronger in their offspring and so on and so forth after several more generations. Okay? I got it. I'll pass that test. Yes, A+. Plus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what's really cool is there's there's lots of kind of examples that are actually quite different of how we changed certain species and selectively bred them to to be very different typically to as i said at the start to increase their yield so the first big example that i have is corn okay we look at corn maize Mm. big beautiful bulgy yellow yolk but it actually came from this tiny kind of light gray weed looking thing in an arid desert called teosinte and you wouldn't believe if you put them beside each other, okay? They're completely different. And so what people didn't realize was that when they were growing this teosinte near their, their where they were living, that they were selecting for genes that maybe made the kernels bigger or the stock bigger, or there's a thing that covers the kernel that's called a glum. And so all of those things at different times were accidentally selected for and then they would grow those and breed those with others with a similar kind of morphology that looked the same that happened over thousands of years in south america 
and they're huge now. They look mm. so different. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, another kind of cool thing about a, a different group of plants, and I'm going to ask you this, Andrew, what do you think is, that cabbage, kale, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower and kohlrabi all have in common? They never make it onto my plate. <laughs> <laughs> They're rotten. That's just a fact. <laughs> so, they are all the exact same species. What? Brassica olaracea. They're all the exact same species. What? Is that real? Yeah. Is that true? It's legit. Oh, that's nuts. And they're all called um, cultivars. So, what happened about, about 5,000 years ago. God, that's mad. Yeah, they all came from a, a type of wild cabbage. Okay. Okay. And something really weird happened early in its evolution that the wild cabbage, for some reason, tripled its genome. So its genome was three times as big as it usually was. Oh, right. And what that meant was that because their genome is so big, they can have large changes in their genome and still yeah. be still breed because they still have that a <laughs> similar enough of a genetic code book to breed. Wow. Um, so it's Good really grief. cool. Like it, all of those things were selectively bred. Maybe one was bred for the stem and you get something like uh, kale or sorry, those are leaves. You get kale and cabbage and Brussels sprouts are for the, the bulb, broccoli, cauliflower, similar thing, right? That is the first time in my life someone has made me interested in those vegetables. <laughs> Just for me to find out that they're all the same. Like I knew they were individually evil but now i know they're all in a class now yeah it's a conspiracy it's a it's a, con it's a conspiracy <laughs> it's a conglomerate it was never about the vegetables it was always the vegetable <laughs> <laughs> an example of a fruit that has weird genetics is actually the banana Ooh, <laughs> this is kind of cool so turns out that bananas are the exact same genetically around the entire world. And really? Yeah, and that wow. bana bananas that you get from anywhere, if you notice, like, they don't have seeds. It's because mm -hmm. the seeds have been selectively bred out of them, so they can't grow a new generation. All of these bananas that you get are from maybe a single or, or, or you know, a single region in the world. Of course. And uh, these these this type is called the Cavendish, okay? We love it. Big, yellow, tasty banana, right? So the deal with the Cavendish is that mm. it has been genetically bottlenecked. This actually happened with its predecessor, which was called the Gros Michel, okay? It was this big, chunky green banana, and it had big seeds, and it wasn't really that nice, but it was quite yeah, sweet, and people right. liked it. But it, okay. the Gros Michel was wiped out by this thing called the Panama disease, and that forced people all around the world, banana growers, to cultivate this Cavendish. But now mm -hmm. the Panama disease is attacking the Cavendish. And so people, all the growers and farmers around the world are terrified that because mm -hmm. the banana is a single species with a very small and simple genome, they are terrified that if the Panama disease infects one crop, it might yeah, wipe out right. all the bananas in the world. <laughs> so, we, we, we could be having that. So, you know... Enjoy yeah. your bananas while you can, okay? Because maybe they'll be gone in a while. All right, all right. No, no, no. Don't don't be getting d bold. Bold. We have enough things to be anxious about. Don't be scaring people about bananas. The bananas will be perfectly fine, as we will get into. We'll always be able to fix them. True. And and to be honest, I just wanted to mention as well that there's about 20,000 edible plant species in the world, but only about 2,000 of them are economically important and actually only about 30 species provide most of the world's plant food which is crazy out of all the species and considering that cabbages i thought they were one and they're like six of them <laughs> or seven of them god only knows what's going yeah, on yeah considering in there. that all of those are one species like there is a lot of different foods it's out there a lot of stuff going on but in terms of animals as well like selective breeding is a perfect example is just modern dogs and we can trace modern dogs way back to two sources there's an asian wolf and there was a european wolf 
and we just slowly domesticated them over time. They would hang around tribes, they mm -hmm. would hang around uh, settlements, and that happened more and more and more. And then there was a huge amount of interbreeding between wolves and Asian and European species of mm -hmm. domesticated dogs. And so now you have this just totally Crazy. complex kind of web of genetic yeah. diversity. But even then, you, you'd be, you wouldn't keep the dogs that would bite your hand either. So mm -hmm. selectively over time, the domesticated dog would stop being as aggressive yeah. and lose that kind of anger trait. That's just like no one is going to go into anywhere and choose the dog that is literally trying to take your throat. <laughs> you know, yeah. you're always you're going to pick the little one that gives you the little eyes and just curls up next to you, you know. And that is actually as well. That's a randomly evolved trait that humans no selected. Way. They thought that it was really cute. And so That's wolves great. have a completely different, the way that the muscles are around their eyes is completely different to modern dogs, which is so cool. No way. That's awesome. So you said it yourself that the modern dogs, we, we selected for the, the, the parts of a, a generation that were more docile and less fearful. Mm -hmm. But we actually also selected for a reduction in brain size. So modern dogs have about 30% smaller brains than wolves. No way. Yeah, and specifically now, Andrew, you might be be able to talk a bit more about this if you want to, but it was a reduction in the limbic system, which is to do oh. with fight or flight. And For so sure. it's like a reduction in the kind of anxiety lizard brain mm. part of their mind, okay. yeah. which is just really interesting. No, that's very, very interesting now, because that's the kind of part of the brain that can overpower all of the more evolved parts of the brain. So what you're kind of saying there is that it almost encourages personality and mm -hmm. dis discourages instant decision making and instant, instant. fight or flighting thing. Yeah, it, it, it lowers instinct and it raises thinking, which is, you know, that probably is why you have really, really smart dogs who will like round up sheep and goats and all these things. That's that really cool. It might not win a fight with, you know, it can look past that and just focus on doing its job. That is so cool. Yeah, so look, really the, interesting. these are loads of different examples of how humans use random genetic mutations in nature to our advantage. Hmm. And Andrew, now you will tell us why we decided guess, yeah. to start changing genes and plants and animals more directly. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting to think back on everything because in reality we've been doing this forever as Aiden went through. You know, it's a, it's effectively saying if you have 10 apple trees and one of them make the most apple, you're going to keep planting that the seeds from that tree. It's yeah. pretty basic economics. You yeah. want the most and you keep doing that and then you end up with a apple tree that's pregnant to the brim <laughs> with apples, yeah. you know, that is Full absolutely going. And uh, the ability of an apple tree or anything like that to develop this is something called a trait. Mm. So a trait would be to produce more apples. A trait in humans would be to be tall, to have a certain colored skin, blue eyes, green eyes, brown eyes, brown hair, to go bald, yeah. uh, to not go bald. All of these kind of things are genetically driven, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And these traits are controlled by our DNA. And our DNA is essentially just a blueprint that is within each and every one of our cells. That is our design. It's essentially just our design. And you have a, a gene in your DNA that codes for you to have your blue eyes. You have a gene in your DNA which will encourage you to grow tall if you have enough nutrients. You have a gene in my DNA that I angrily you know, think about late at night as my hair falls out as I age. <laughs> we, <laughs> But this is all things which, again, could have been selectively breeded for. I think in the past, blue eyes were very, very rare. But then as people coming from Nordic countries came places, people were like, dang, they got pretty eyes. Human, humans love eyes. Eyes are great. And they were like, oh, so now blue eyes have become way more common. And this is literally just selective breeding. Um, it's it's a weird flex, me and Aiden flashing our blue eyes through this uh, audio medium. <laughs> but but it is, it's a, it's a true thing. So we selectively breed to have more blue eyes, which is a good example. So it's all about controlling these genes 
that create these traits. Yeah. If we want more apples, we need to change the gene that produces more apples. Mm -hmm. But this is tricky. You can't just like get a knife and go into uh, DNA and cut it out easy peasy. Yeah. But but we did know in the sixties that DNA coded for your existence, that it coded for your traits. So mm -hmm. listen to this, Aiden. The first attempt to genetically modify a plant was in the 60s. And they had no idea how to go at the DNA. They had no <laughs> notion at all. But what they did know, they had one idea. It's the 60s after all in the States. They were like, radiation, that stuff messes you up. <laughs> so what they did, they got a load of radiation. I'm sure in the 60s, they had a load of uranium that they just didn't know what to do with. Yeah. And absolutely bombarded plants with radiation to trigger as many mutations as it could. Mm -hmm. The idea being, and they would do this to thousands and thousands and thousands of plants. Mm -hmm. For some plants, they died because not all mutations are good. <laughs> you know, yeah. maybe, maybe they lost the trait that helps them absorb water. Very bad. Very bad. But for a few cases, it was like a genetic lottery because they were just knocking all genes around. Mm -hmm. They got plants that were superior to their predecessors by yeah. pure fluke. You know, so that's kind of the nature of mutations. A lot of it is very, very, very fluky. But in the 70s, we started to get a little bit more knowledgeable about how to do this. And we started to actually be able to design DNA and stuff. So what scientists started being able to do is literally just getting a bit of code, a bit of DNA code for mm -hmm. a trait or something, and just putting it into bacteria, putting it into plants and putting it into animals. Mm -hmm pretty much just to see what would happen like they didn't they didn't really have a plan like at this yeah. point they didn't really it was know was purely exploratory like exploratory they were like what happens if we put dna in this bacteria what happens if we do this and they were kind of trying to get insights for primarily medicine and agriculture right yeah and the first GM animal was in 1974 and it was a mouse which I'm going to shout out again mice and rats have saved more lives than any any other species on earth mm. okay the the mouse and the rat let's shout out to them they are a beautiful species which have saved an incredible amount of human lives that's amazing but in 1974 a mouse was the first GMO animal they yeah. didn't do anything exciting with it but what they did was they had a piece of a, a virus. They had a little virus. And as we are, we are all now immunologists, you know, we've all spent a year talking about immunology. So <laughs> you'll all keep up with me here. Yeah. They put this virus into the mouse embryo. And within the mouse embryo, as it was in early development, the virus integrated itself into every one of those cells. So this, although the viral DNA wasn't they they had taken out some of it or shot it with something that made it so it wouldn't kill the mouse yeah but it integrated its dna the viral dna into the mouse's dna and this mouse grew up with this modified dna so this was the first genetically modified although it wasn't for a great purpose mm -hmm. it was the first time that we were like oh my god we can actually put dna in animals we oh, can put incredible. dna in things very, very cool. After that, we started to try and get more purposeful. So in the 80s, we started to figure out, hey, we can start to identify genes in bacteria and in animals that can do stuff. So the first commercial GMO was it was very easy to put DNA in bacteria because you just get a really, 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 really tiny needle <laughs> and suck up a bit of DNA you make and shove it into the bacteria and see what happens. So they made a bacteria that could suck oil. So they could use it in loads of places, okay? So they were trying to get it into the ocean and stuff to deal with oil spills. They were trying to deal with a load of things around oil refineries and stuff like that. That's really cool. Yeah, and the, the bacteria would just suck it up and it would be gone. Now, in 1994 is when we get the first instance of the classic chemtrail ideology of GMOs. You know, like, <gasps> not a GMO, yeah. where they developed a tomato a tomato that was genetically modified. So they knocked out the gene that helps it to collect waste. 
So in normal times, this is fine because plants have a life cycle that go around and round. And when a, a fruit is rotting, that's okay. Mm. It's going to use the the in, the energy that it made to, you know, replenish the seeds, which will fall to the ground and then hopefully regrow. Yeah. There was a life cycle there. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we want to eat a tomato... We have no interest in the well-being of future generations of that tomato. No. Sorry, tomato. So we knocked out this gene and the tomato then had a longer shelf life. Mm. So this the, this tomato in question is called the flavor saver because <laughs> the idea was that it would hold on to its flavor for longer and yeah. it wouldn't get sour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Now, it was around the 90s again that we started meddling with humans as well. You know, not, not anything like we'll get into later, so you better stick around. But we started to figure out ways to help people and ways to treat people. And we started being able to read DNA better. We started to be able to see what could be done. Mm -hmm. So over the 90s until modern day, over the last 30 years, we have been able to make clotting factors, growth hormones and insulin in bacteria. We've been able to put the DNA and the RNA into this bacteria and then it will create it. And that's a genetically modified organism. Sure, it's a bacteria. And yeah, you don't care about bacteria. But I'm telling you, E. coli will mess up your poos. But it is saving lives. <laughs> you know, saving my are, life. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, so you can develop E. coli that will make a load of insulin. And then they collect the insulin and that's where we get most of the insulin that's given today. And before we could do this, we would be harvesting it from people and from animals. Animals, yeah. So there would be, yeah, there'd be animals bred just to have their insulin harvested mm. and then given to people. And it'd be less effective because the whole process is inefficient. Uh, but this is much, much better. But we're seeing it in loads of different places. Think of we have changed pigs to get way more muscular. So like pigs from before and pigs today. Man, pigs today are bodybuilders in comparison. Yeah. They, get, they get huge. They're lean. Right? They have changed the way that salmon grow. And now they're all faster growing, which makes them better economically. Yeah. They have developed chickens that don't grow feathers, which saves a whole process in the agriculture. We can talk about the ethics of this after. Like, I'm just going to bring this up now. I, it's not that I'm glossing over it. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> Things like see-through frogs is another example. And you can even get, if, it, if this isn't the epitome of capitalism, you can get glow-in-the-dark fish for about 10 euro, yeah. if you'd like. You know, these are genetically modified fish for a tenor. Guess where they got that gene? Where? From a jellyfish. Was it from a jellyfish? Yes, Aiden? and a guy won a Nobel Prize for it. For, for glow-in-the-dark protein. <laughs> I actually didn't know that. That's really, really cool. Mm. Today, we're getting things which are genetically modified like that for a tenor. Now, when we go back to the 70s and the 80s and the ones I just went through, this cost a fortune. Mm. Like, to make the first flavor saver tomato must have cost a ton of money. And then once they got it right, they just kept reproducing it by planting seeds and collecting seeds and rinse and repeat. You know what I mean? So there wasn't yeah. a continuous GMO aspect there. But today, you can literally just get glow-in-the-dark fish <laughs> for the crack. So... There has been a massive development in people's ability to create GMOs and it's gotten faster and it's gotten cheaper. And Aiden is going to guide us through the technology that has come up that is super, super cool, sweet and maybe a little bit crisp. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you always hit with those dad jokes and I never know what to do with them. That means they're good. <laughs> Stun, stunned sadness and unsure how to respond is a sign of a great dad joke. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like a, oh. it's like a pain. It's like a pain. Mm. Good, good. Seethe on it. Scrounge break. Do you ever worry about the forty-seven side effects of that pill you're taking to quell the need to collect every My Little Pony figurine that has ever existed? Me neither. So go to patreoncom livingroomlogic and worry about donating money to two lads that get tipsy and exploit other people's contributions to the ocean of human knowledge. <laughs> Classic. So, speaking of CRISPR, 
Mm. The technology that has been thought up by some Nobel Prize winners in 2020, this thing CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. So catchy. (laughs) So fun. (laughs) So that's why we call it CRISPR, because we're never going to say that again. CRISPR is actually a defense mechanism used Mm. by a certain type of bacteria. It's a genetic defense mechanism against bacterial viruses, which are called Mm -hmm. bacteriophage. Mm. And again, these Nobel Prize winners that I'll talk about in a sec, they kind of talk about it as if it is a genetic vaccination card for, for bacteria. Think of it like this. When a virus attacks a bacteria, it will inject its own RNA into the bacteria. It will inject its own genetic code. And what happens is the the bacteria has this system called CRISPR that actually will detect this and copy some of that RNA, some of that genetic code of the virus, and it will keep it there for another time. And specifically, it's a protein called CRISPR-Cas9 is the protein that if that virus ever attacks that bacteria again, if the bacteria survived, that protein will go through the virus's RNA and Mm -hmm. it'll shear it and it'll cut it like a scissors. Snip, snip. And it's really amazing. And so it doesn't sound like something that we could use for genetic engineering straight away. Bacteria's defense mechanism but this cas9 protein is like a genetic swiss army knife because you, it can find specific genes in dna or rna and it can delete a certain part or it can actually add genes if you give it a donor rna so you can actually add specific genes to a genome of any organism of any species and so that's what these people did, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier. In 2020, they won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for discovering yeah. this system and kind of talking about the, the potential applications of CRISPR and the fact that not only, like, let's take this from bacteria and let's use it for so many different things, And actually, interestingly, one of the first applications a lot of people thought up of is to actually use it against bacteria, which is really cool. So me and Andrew have previously talked, uh, I think it was in uh, Bugs Are the Pest, we talked Mm. about antibiotic resistant bacteria. And the, the deal with that is that uh, there's only so many antibiotics that Uh, medicine and science can come up with uh, you know in the modern world and we're using them like crazy and certain bacteria are just mutating enough that they can basically take any antibiotic you throw at it okay Mm -hmm. so what some researchers came up with was to turn this against them they actually program viruses to inject the dna of the actual resistant bacteria into the bacteria and so when the bacteria finds this kind of viral resistant bacteria mix dna they they destroy themselves and the cas9 proteins within themselves kill themselves and it's it's kind of it's so sinister but it's yeah it's it's ingenious it's ingenious it is and so there's there's a couple of different amazing kind of medical applications that they've come up with. Another one is actually to do with HIV. You know, it's one of the most kind of deadly and uh, maybe not so so much deadly anymore, but it's it's one of the worst kind of viral infections anyone can get in the world. And trial studies have been done where where CRISPR has been used to target HIV DNA in human cells in lab trials and and, and reduce the percentage of HIV infected cells in rats by 50%. So these kind of trials with 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 uh, mice and rats they're they're probably going to turn into human clinical trials very oh, soon. For sure. 
using that defense mechanism that bacteria have evolved, just completely taking them out of bacteria and just using it for humans. And it's it really, it's a shot. You, It's a shot that you yeah. give someone and it travels through the body and it changes the genetics of your body. It's amazing. The one last thing that I will say about the the medical uses is actually to cure or maybe treat or really reduce the impacts of severe genetic diseases. So one example that I saw was a, a, a disease called Huntington's disease. And so, Andrew, you might know some more about this, but this is really to do with the accumulation of toxic proteins in the brain over mm-hmm. several decades. And it usually kills people maybe at 40 or 50 onwards. And mm-hmm. so it's horrible. It's a horrible disease. And CRISPR therapeutic drugs have been produced to to reduce these protein concentrations in rats again and in and in mice in lab scenarios this could be brought to human trials and that could be a drug that you could if after you've developed huntingtons that you're genetically predisposed after that even so you can still change it after you've been born after you've developed as an adult which is amazing what i would say that's something that fascinates me a lot about crispr is that, as you might imagine, we have a absolutely gigantic genome with an outrageous amount of genes. Mm. Like uh, I was, I I work with this kind of stuff myself, and I was looking at a transcriptomic p- data set, and this essentially was all of the genes that the machine could find in a sample. And there was in that data set alone, there was over thirty thousand genes. Now. Wow. How to actually figure out what each of these 30,000 genes actually do is not easy, (laughs) you know, and especially in the past, it was incredibly, incredibly difficult. Yeah. And to be fair, we know what most of them do now, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. But there are still some genes that we don't know what they do or they don't seem too significant. But with CRISPR, what's very, very easy to do is let's say we had this data set and we noticed that in a mouse model of Alzheimer's, for example, this gene was increased for for, for whatever reason. It was increased. Yeah. But in the normal mouse, it wasn't. Right. That's interesting. Perhaps this gene is involved. So what we can then do is use CRISPR, remove that gene and, seize what, and see what happens. Mm-hmm. And if you see symptoms get better in the Alzheimer's mouse, you know, right, that's worth investigating. And this sounds like a very logical series of steps to take. Mm -hmm. But without CRISPR, you're looking at this gene going, hmm, that's interesting. And that's it. You can't go forward with it. But with CRISPR, you can actually look at that and go, right, let's get rid of that. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where a lot of research at the moment is going. Mm -hmm. My own research at the moment, we're trying to find proteins that are differentially expressed in men and women. And we're trying to differentiate between what's genetic, what's hormonal, what's a mixture of both. Perhaps Mm. estrogen produces more of an effect in females than males in some scenarios. And what's really great about CRISPR is if we identify a protein that might be quite important to noticing these differences, Mm -hmm. we can literally go into a model and just knock it out and see if the differences between males and females still exist. So cool. Which is crazy because this kind of information comes in and then you'd be there looking at the epidemiology of many, many diseases like autoimmune diseases affect women three three to four times more than men. Wow. And most of it is highly misunderstood, which will be something I'll talk about next season for sure. Mm-hmm. But being able to identify the problem and actually knock it out and figure out, hey, what does that do? Mm. has already led to a ton of findings which are going to have huge effects mm. in the in the next couple of years. Kind of started a bit of a genetic revolution, you know? Oh, absolutely. Because not only, I mean, Andrew, you're saying that you can knock out a specific gene, but yeah. as I said before, you can also put in a new gene. So a gene that that organism really shouldn't yeah. have or yeah. that as naturally I'm saying, or you can like just turn off a gene for a while. Yeah. And then the Cas9 protein will, uh, it won't f- fully cut it. It will just sit on it for a while and then get off and then it can be upregulated again. Yeah. There's a load of really, so really fast. It's super versatile. Like and I, I yeah. think 
the yeah. craziest thing, man, is that CRISPR has been used for a single human trial. And we're talking humans that are alive right now. <laughs> yeah. And it was actually a Chinese study and it is a little bit shoddy and mm. I will explain why. They used CRISPR in uh, an IVF study, so in vitro yep. uh, fertilization, because of a parent who was HIV positive, okay? The male in the relationship was HIV positive and they wanted to ensure that the children would not be affected by the HIV and to prove that they would be immune to the HIV, they actually deleted a certain gene which is involved with how HIV enters a human cell. Wow. I think it's called an E or or 5 gene. I might be wrong. But this gene was deleted. And hmm. this gene has several other functions as well, which the researchers really didn't take into account when they decided to delete it from the children's mm -hmm. genomes. And they managed to get, I think it was like 13 um, embryos and then one of them was selected and then the donor had twins. And so the twins are called Lulu and Nana and they are alive today and they don't have that specific gene. Wow. The thing is, though, the scientific community on a global scale went wild and they completely condemned this research lab. And it was really ugly. Um, yeah. They basically said, you have not done the necessary ethical evaluation of what might mm -hmm. happen to these children in maybe yeah. 20 years. We don't know what yeah. by turning off even a single gene has to do with that. But some people were saying that maybe it might actually enhance their brain function. But then if it's to do with brain function, it might actually have a very different uh, reaction with mm. their the development of these of these people and and the unfortunate thing is because of the rules of chinese research and the chinese government we can't ever know yeah. we'll never find out they do not have to come forward ever in their lifetime and it will probably remain unknown as to what happened to these two children but the craziest thing about this study even if they'd only changed one gene was actually that this the lead researcher was fired from his job. He was banned from ever doing genetic research ever again in China. And he was sentenced uh, to three years in prison. Yeah, and he was fined half yeah. a million dollars worth of uh, uh, yen. So his life has been ruined because he jumped the gun on the, the kind of race to modify humans, you know. Because this is the hope in the future is... You know, and we talked about this in another episode about about biohackers and cybernetic yeah. organisms is that there's a, a subculture of people who are mad to get enhanced. They want all the enhancements they can get. Of course. Give it to me genetically, give it to me using robotics or mechanics yeah. or, you know, put a neural link in my brain. Yeah. But this CRISPR has the potential to create these designer babies with... Yeah higher IQ and 2020 vision and six foot tall and great muscle mass and zero yeah. body fat and all these things like and all of that sounds you know you you kind of wince when you hear it you know you do I I well I do I wince when I hear it because it's you know I think there's a culture in the world today of you have to be perfect you have to be happy you have to be all those things and in reality people aren't and humans yeah. aren't yeah but again I'm wincing, mm. but on a purely outside point of view, what's the difference between someone genetically modifying the way they look and someone physically modifying the way they look with plastic surgery? Like there is no superficial difference. Like yeah. is there, if I want to have green eyes and I genetically do it or a surgeon <laughs> manages to put green eyes in me, mm. what's the difference? You get what I'm saying? I do for most things except for the IQ. 
Um, there's yeah. some things that you can't pay for and you can't do a surgery and get. So those sort of things are a ethical grey area. And speaking of ethical grey area, Andrew's going to actually tell us about <laughs> one more very kind of confusing or there is a grey area in this study uh, and it's to do with mosquitoes. So we went through in an episode before, I think it was again, Bugs Are the Pest, where yeah. bugs were in fact not at all good, but these mosquitoes are the cause of most illness in the world. Yeah. So, you know, it's fine to not like mosquitoes. Yeah. So, you know, you imagine a world that doesn't have mosquitoes and you're like, great. <laughs> However, we're also terrified of an ecological breakdown because obviously something eats the mosquito. Yeah. And whatever eats the mosquito gets eaten by something else. And this could go all the way up. And as yeah. we all know, mosquitoes suck and they're bloody everywhere. So that they're a big food, they're a big food source Absolutely. to something. But they cause all this illness and humans are selfish. So let's kill them. Mm. So this, uh, what, what happened recently, well, it, very, very recently, like in the last two years, was California released 750 million male mosquitoes that were genetically modified into the wild. Yeah. 750 million male mosquitoes. Okay. I want to make sure that those facts be in. The way that these organisms, these mosquitoes, were genetically modified was that basically when a lady mosquito and a papa mosquito make sweet love, the, they, they lay their eggs in water, right? Mm. These mosquitoes were modified. So the only water that they could survive in was something that was riddled with antibiotics, right? So they had a genetic thing that when they were being grown... They had to grow in water riddled with antibiotics. Whoa. That was the only way they could survive, right? Okay. So the idea was whenever they released these 750 million mosquitoes into the wild, they would have sex, they would lay eggs, and those babies would die in natural water, not riddled with antibiotics. Yeah. Now, interesting points to keep in mind with this. They only did male mosquitoes, right? And they only did male mosquitoes to get over a ethical jump. OK, because the ethical jump was mozzies are bad. Mozzies call, cause illness. What, you can't do that. OK, but only the female mozzies need to drink blood. Only female mozzies need to drink blood. And it's because the blood is needed to make the nutrients to have the baby mosquitoes. Okay. Not the male ones. So there was a there was a issue there because obviously 750 million more disease carrying things are not good. But the males don't need to drink blood. So there oh. was a thing to get over. So they there. got past that. Yeah. Right. So but they, the way they made it was that the males would tend to survive more often. So the babies would be born. The males would be able to survive. But the females wouldn't be. Yeah. OK. So this gene was X-linked. And if they had the Y chromosome, they were fine, essentially is the idea. Mm -hmm. So eventually the females would die out. That's the idea. They would mate as much as they could. The babies would be born. The males would be able to live. The females would not. And eventually you'd run out of females. That was the goal. And eventually the guys, there'd be like a billion male mosquitoes going around looking for any, any, anything that looked like a lady. And there would be a sharp population crash. Exactly. So... This is a really interesting, real big world application of genetic modification, because what this is essentially saying is we have all agreed the genocide of mosquitoes is perfectly fine. <laughs> yeah. You know, we 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 everyone in the world was like, ee! they they like they essentially put out these boxes and they were like, OK, you can release these mosquitoes, but they can't carry more disease. They mm. can't do this. They can't do that. And they were pretty easy boxes to tick. And they released 750 million. Crazy. And they're continuing to make them and they're continuing to release them. So it, it opens up some really complicated things to talk about, you know, like, mm. is this a slippery slope? Because what's next? You mm. know, what's the what's the next pest going around? 
Yeah. And it's it's not like we haven't been doing it forever. So classically, GMOs, we, we usually GMOs are usually associated with organic versus genetically modified agriculture, you know? Yeah. And the original version of this was corn. You you went through before you yeah. were talking about corn, making more corn. Mm-hmm. But there's insects that love corn. Oh, they love mm. corn, Aiden. But insects do not love us because mm. we like and we corn. Don't and, like, th- and we don't like them eating our corn. Exactly. So what they did was they genetically modified corn to have a protein in it that would essentially destroy an insect from the inside out. Mm. Okay, it was poisonous to insects. So mm. they would eat it. They'd munch it. They'd die. It was a pesticide. But in humans, we we it doesn't impact us no, at all. It just in goes the, right it, through your body. Yeah, it'd be the same thing as chocolate, where chocolate is delightful for us. We like it, but mm. do not give it to your doggy, okay? Because it's very bad for a yeah, doggy. Yeah, it's poisonous to dogs, yeah. Exactly. So it's the same idea. But this agriculture, it keeps going because then they would put in genes that would make it resistant to weed killers and yeah. stuff like that. And, you know, it makes sense. You want there to be less weeds on your farmland because that way you're getting the most out of the land. You're not getting weeds that are taking up nutrients that could go into your crops. Yeah. But again, there's lots of questions there. So even either of these maize or corn, like, what if they then integrate with organic corn? Have you just made a new species? And this is something called gene flow. So mm. if you make these genetically modified organisms, take those poor Chinese children who never had a choice in this. What, ha- yeah. what what's the what's the ethics around them having children? Yeah, I know, you know? because they, they they will pass that knocked off E or or five exactly gene for generations. Yeah, but again, we get into real blurry area, real blurry area, because there's lots of people who are born without certain genes, yeah. regardless of if they were genetically modified. They were born with certain mutations of certain genes. Mm-hmm. And you can't tell a person who was born, it's your fundamental human right to pretty much do what you want without harming others. Mm. So it, it, it's very, very complicated. But with the with corn, you can kind of take a stronger hand than you could with <laughs> human beings. <laughs> so they, they do have a way of doing this. So what they can essentially do is make these this corn second generation infertile, right? And this is called terminator seeds. So basically, you plant the seed, it will grow. If it breeds with another seed or another mm-hmm. thing, it, it won't grow. Mm-hmm. So this makes sense. This is a good way of preventing gene flow. Mm-hmm. However, this also means that farmers cannot recoup the seeds from their crops to then replant them the next year, Mm -hmm. which means farmers have to spend even more money from every single year buying more and more seeds from these companies. Mm -hmm. And it's created a really toxic environment. So there are only four companies, Aiden, that actually produce these seeds, and it's Bayer, Corteva, ChemChina, and Basif, right? And these four seed companies control the entire sector for agriculture and seed growth. Total pyramid scheme. Total pyramid scheme, and the farmers can't do anything. That's okay. right. They they can't do anything because organic cannot economically compete with genetically modified mm. agriculture mm. and crops because the they yield grow- is just so good. It's ridiculously good. It's a shame because like GMOs in that scenario, are really they're being pulled in with a different debate about for sure. corporate greed and the state of agriculture in the states. For sure. It's it's really important to differentiate that the problem here is not the crops. You know, like we we're not actually like the crops are are great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the they, crops they are eat. just fatter and stronger. Yeah, the the crops are fine. There is there's been 30 years now of studies of eating genetically modified food since that damn tomato the flavor saver. And <laughs> they have sexy found sexy tomato <laughs> grinning at it as all the other tomatoes rot. Yeah. But 30 years of research and there is no increased risk of eating food that is genetically modified versus organic. Mm-hmm. There's no change in how it impacts your health. Mm-hmm. So it's a total urban myth. The problems around this are the fact that there's only some people that control 
everything that's going on. Mm. And there is, there's a huge uh, abuse of it because even when we were talking about the weed killer as well, they're absolutely lobbing the stuff into the ground yeah. and it's terrible for the ground and it's excess weed killer being on the food, that's not good for us either. Yeah. Right? So the most commonly used a, lot, a few years ago was Roundup. Mm. Right? And Roundup, it was in the news because a company got um, fined a billion dollars for it because mm-hmm. they were using it too much and Roundup is really bad for you. And the people who were actually putting out the Roundup on the farms were developing early Parkinson's. Wow. Okay. To, now, this is like, it will not happen to you. We're talking about people who literally every day for 10 to 15 to 20 years were s- coming home wet from the stuff. Okay. Yeah, so we're talking about. it in for years. Yeah. Like, yeah. For years. It, like smoking, but weed killer. Okay, yeah, so yeah. it's not something that would affect us. Again, GMOs are fine, but it was happening to these people and it was reckless endangerment by mm. the company. Mm-hmm. But this is where it would, and that would not be possible without the use of an organism that has been built to protect it. Do you see where we're coming in here? Yeah. So the, it, it's very, very tricky. And mm. more food in a hungry world where starvation occurs is good. Mm-hmm. The problem, as it oftenly is, is greed. Yeah, I mean, I have a perfect example of a food that was genetically modified and has saved millions of lives and livelihoods, quality of life. Mm. It was a a type of rice that was uh, genetically modified. Oh, golden rice. Is that it? Golden rice. Genetically modified because... Lots of people were going blind in the third world because of oh, wow. vitamin A deficiency. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, a fella decided, well, let's just genetically modify a staple crop that people use all the time in Asia to also incorporate a high concentration of vitamin A. Of course. And yeah. hey presto, golden rice was produced and... He won a Nobel Prize and, you know, he's a hero. Like, people are like, look, man, that is yeah. one of the best inventions that has come out of the yeah. the 21st century. Second only to the mouse and the rat, of course. But, yeah, no, he is. Yeah, he is. exactly. <laughs> or using them in studies. Uh, yeah, but honestly, benefit. the use and the utility of GMOs is incredible. Mm. It's incredible. Sure, they're even changing and the ability to genetically modify crops is being used to harden crops to the impact of climate change. So they're using yeah. it so crops would be more resistant to drought yeah. and they would they would be able to handle flooding and things like that. Mm. And, well, I, I hate to say it to you guys, but in about two episodes, you're going to understand just how important that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to be shaking in your boots, as Andrew said. So GMOs are good. It's mm-hmm. just people can be not good. <laughs> and a final statement on the ethics of using it in humans. I'm actually quite proud of the scientific community in that they incurred a hiatus, a pause in the use of this in, in human trials. They yeah. said, please, let's take a step back for a decade yeah let's keep studying it in embryos let's keep studying it in uh, you know stem cells and and in cells but let's not use it in live human trials and yeah (laughs) make people have babies that are genetically modified when we don't know what the heck the genes might do to them in 10 or 20 years and they've actually listened and so you know that a Chinese researcher and some of his assistants, they went to jail. And yeah. that's justice. It was a crime. And so, until there's a mountain of scientific evidence that it is okay to use in certain circumstances, which I am very, very sure it will be, until that day, we shouldn't be doing this stuff. But the day will come very soon. Because people are working on thousands of these papers using CRISPR in stem cells and everything else right now. And in 10, 15 years, maybe it will be okay to have a designer baby. 
And to be honest, I'm still shocked that cabbage and all of those things are the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> like, that blows my mind just as much. And on that note, good luck to you. Hope you had a good one. God bless you, lads. This is the end of the podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time. If you're feeling generous and you're not completely skinned, why don't you give us some of your money? Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon. Join our Patreon.